And it's the NIV version. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his name, or in his hand, are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he has made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are his people, the people of his pasture and the flock under his care. Let's sing to the Lord. Let's bless him with a song. Amen. We got a reason to sing.
bless the Lord. You can be seated real quick. A baptism this morning. So, so my name is Dennis Hampton. If you guys don't know me, um, I'm honored and blessed to be an elder here at Shelby Christian this year. I'm also deacon over recovery ministries here called Community Recovery. These two are some of our uh, leaders and uh, attendees and Brad, Josh, Josh is Brad's one. Yep. So, they, uh, they're not only best friends, they're neighbors, but they do recovery together, and it is, it's passionate to see it. Um, for everybody in this room, community recovery is on Wednesday nights right here in the lobby at 6.30. Everybody's welcome. And if you don't think you got recovery for something, you need to be there, because I'm going to give you a blue chip Wednesday night. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Brad. Brad, you got it. Josh, I just want you to repeat after me. I believe. I believe. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. And I accept him as my Lord and Savior. And I accept him as my Lord and Savior. With the confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Son, Father, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life. Well, those of you that know me, I'm Bobby Woods, a discipleship pastor at Shelby Christian. And you all know how much I like to read. Well, sometimes I read some really weird stuff. And um, this week I came across this article that said that we have between 30 and 50 million armadillos in the United States. Unfortunately, between a quarter million and a half million of them die each year due to their stupidity of staying in the middle of the road. You would think if you've seen an armadillo, they have, they have like nine different layers of really hard outside that, that's supposed to protect them. But when it comes to being in the middle of the road, there's no protection. In fact, National Geographic says that their hapless propensity for being run over by cars has earned them the nickname Hillbilly Speed Bump. Now, unfortunately, I think a lot of us get duped into staying into the middle of the road. We don't want to make a stand. We don't want to offend someone. So we're not likely to share our faith because of our fears. Jesus Christ never stood in the middle of the road. Jesus was always on the right path. And he gave his life up <clears throat> for each and every one of us. And this morning as we go to celebrate communion, I hope that you are willing to take a stand this morning. Pastor Dave's going to be talking about the church in Laodicea and how Jesus said he didn't want them being lukewarm anymore. I pray that your faith is not lukewarm. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just praise you this morning. Father, I would pray that your Holy Spirit would just fall upon this room this morning. That you would continue to anoint the worship team as they lead us, Father, into your presence. Father, I pray that you would anoint Pastor Dave as he comes this morning and brings, Father, the message that you have given to him for us. And Father, as we go to celebrate communion, we take that little piece of bread and that cup. It may it remind us of your son's body which was broken for us and the blood that he shed for us. Oh God, you are so good. Your word promises us that you love us forever, that there's no height, no debt, nothing on this earth that can separate us from your love. And Father, it is your love that we celebrate this morning. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must end And you never do So I throw up my hands Praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide. Can you just lift your hands as a sign of surrender to our King? Oh, now come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Because you've got a lion inside of your lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy.
He's good, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. Come on, we're going to raise a hallelujah in this place. Come on. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah.
make some noise in this place. God is up to something. God is up to something. Listen, you guys are already part of the biggest non-Easter Sunday we've ever had. God is doing something, and some of you have got some ashes that you come out of, and some of you are here today because God wants to do what he just did with Josh in your life today. That's why you're here. So let's sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. came. We knew that uh, you had spoken uh, to Stu uh, as he planned this worship service. We know that was the Holy Spirit speaking to him. I pray that same Holy Spirit has spoken through what you've asked me to write down and to share. And God, we know that you are up to something. And God, we know that there are hearts and lives that need to be changed today. And so God, may we learn from your word in the powerful name of Jesus. We all pray together. Amen. Amen. I've been, <laughs> I've been waiting 36 years for that. I'm just saying, <laughs> I've been waiting 36 years for, for that. Life is all a matter of choices. Life is all a matter of choices. Like you chose to come today. I'm so glad you guys are here. How many of you know far more about armadillos than you thought you would ever know? <laughs> See, it's been a good day, right? It's been a good day. Get out of the road. Get out of the road. Then Malcolm Gladwell has written a book called Blink. It's a bestseller. And basically, in this book, what he talks about are the choices that we have to make in the blink of an eye. He calls it thin slicing. He's a, this, you've got a little bit of information, and you've got to do the best that you can do with what information you have in that moment, in that moment of time. He also says in that book that split-second or snap-second judgments are often more accurate than when we take the time to analyze the situation. You, you know what that's like? That, ana- that paralysis by analysis, like I'm just going to think and think and think. It's like that, that hunter that has waited and waited and waited for that big buck. And that big buck finally walks out and he's ready. Aim. 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 And the buck walks away. (laughs) Eventually you got to fire. And sometimes in life, we've got to make those decisions. He says in his book, our unconscious reactions come out of a locked room, and we can't look inside of that room. Guided by experience, a person can become an expert, but it's up to us to figure out from experience. Have you learned anything from experience? Hopefully, you've learned some good things from experience. Hopefully, you've learned some lessons from some bad experiences. Learn the lessons to, to never go back there again, to never repeat that again, because it was something that was painful. And so we learn from it. We learn never to go there. We've been in this, we're at the end of this exciting journey through the seven churches that Jesus asked John to write letters or postcards to that are found in the book of Revelation in chapters two and three. And we're on the final church today. But so far what we've done is we've walked through these churches. Hopefully, maybe we can lay out for you and show you that there's been a progression. There's been a progression of destructive choices 
in many of these churches. We started off with the church at Ephesus. Remember that? Seven weeks ago, we started off with there, and they were doing good stuff. Jesus said they're doing all, all these good things, but you've lost that love and feeling. Remember that when we talked about you, you, just weren't lo- you weren't loving me and weren't loving each other like you used to. And then Jason took, Jason took us to Smyrna, and they were doing really good, but they were doing so good, they were getting attacked for it. They were getting persecuted for it, for what they were doing that was so good. And then we went to Pergamum, and, and they were doing good, but they were... Getting, They were kind of starting to tolerate some stuff, some false teaching. And then we moved on to Thyatira and that toleration had turned into compromise. And remember that that Jezebel, remember Jesus used that phraseology? You've let that Jezebel into your services and and that things are changing. And then we went to Sardis and Jason took us back there and he said like, you're almost dead. It it was like, they were that church that was in the ICU and, and the little blips on the line were getting smaller and more far apart. They were almost dead. And then last week, we kind of transitioned a little bit, and we went to Philadelphia, not the one in Pennsylvania, but the Philadelphia. And they, in that one, it was so amazing. They did everything good. There, Jesus said, I got nothing against you. Like, way to go. It was, there was no condemnation. It was all commendation. Way to go. You guys are doing the, against all odds. Against all odds, you got this, you got this synagogue of Satan there and all these, and you're still, way to go, you're doing good. And so this week, as we finish this, this last church, Laodicea, it's the most southeastern of the seven churches that are there. It's an interesting place, but just the opposite of Philadelphia, Jesus says, you guys aren't getting anything right. There was no commendation, all condemnation, because they were playing the fence. And Jesus said, you got to get out of the road, Armadillo. You, you got to move on and you got to make some choices. There was a guy doing a man on the street interview one day. And he was walking up and down the street and he was asking people, what are the two greatest problems facing our nation today? If you were asked that question, somebody stopped you today and asked you that question. You got an answer? What are the two greatest problems facing our nation today? One guy that he stopped said this, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> The interviewer said, you know, you're exactly right. Ignorance and apathy. (laughs) I don't know. Ignorance. I don't care. Apathy. And those same problems are facing churches throughout the world today. Ignorance and apathy. I'll I'll be there. I'm going to show up today. I'll get my Jesus on for an hour. I get a check mark. And then about the 55 minute mark this morning, we start getting a little nervous. We start getting a little nervous and we start thinking, oh man, come on, hey, come on, Dave, hurry up. The Baptists are going to beat us to Cracker Barrel. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but we, we, we get out of line because we're, we're making the wrong choices. We're looking at the wrong things to choose. Sometimes choices are life and death. Marie Antoinette, figure in history. She was the queen of France, and her husband was King Louis XVI. She made a last-minute decision to destroy all chances of her her family escaping death. They were planning this counter-revolution against the French rebels and decided to flee to Paris to hide out for a while. And one of their generals, General Belay, came to her and said, he advised her for the family to take two separate carriages for the journey. But Marie Antoinette insisted that they travel together in the fancy carriage. Hmm. Bad choice. What was the problem with the fancy carriage? Everybody knew who rode in the fancy carriage. It was like putting a target on their back. They sure enough, they were captured and eventually killed. They couldn't survive that bad decision. If you got your Bibles, we're in Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 14. As John gives us Jesus' introduction, to the church. Look at what it says here. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. So just like the other six letters, just like the other six letters, Jesus starts off with an introduction of who's writing and who the letter's to. It's from him. He wants to make it clear this is from the one who is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. This isn't something that John made up. This is something that I told him. It's coming from me. He's just writing and sending to you. He wants them to know that. And it's to this church at Laodicea. 
Laodicea is such an interesting town. And, and I, w- I want to share something. Because, and listen to the things I share about Laodicea. Because it's so cool. It's so cool what Jesus does with this. Laodicea is this very affluent city that Antichus, uh, Na- Antichus II uh, founded and named after his wife Laodicea. And it was to honor her. Now, the interesting, one of the interesting things about this city was, we've talked about a lot through our, our journey here through these churches. We talked about the importance of those first three churches. They were all in the Mediterranean, so they had the waterway there, and there was all this help. There was all this being able to transport for commerce and all that went with that. Well, Laodicea is inland, and there is no waterway at all. But what they did have was they had three highways. All right, now, you stay with me. Their highway, much different than ours. And we're talking about three, a highway for them was a wide dirt road, okay? So they had three wide dirt roads uh, that, that all intersected there coming from every direction. So once you get this in your mind, think Louisville, Kentucky. I-65. I-64, I-71, right? All right, so we can get that image. And if you go a little bit east of here, then you throw in I-75. And that's what makes this part of the country that some people wouldn't have thought would ever be this such an interesting place for commerce and such a thriving place because it's got all these interstates. It's got an international airport, two international, three international airports. And you throw in the Ohio River. I mean, we can transport anything any way you want, all right? And, And that was Laodicea. For that day and time, they, it was this intersection of all the, Now, the, the downside of the intersection of all those interstates is you got people coming from everywhere with all kinds of different thoughts. And some of them are really whacked out, all right? But that's, that's who Laodicea is. The, the second thing that's important for us to know, they were known for three things. Laodicea was known for three things. For banking, for manufacturing, and medicine. They were one of the wealthiest places, they said, very affluent, and so their banks were, for what they had going on in that day, they couldn't do wire transfers, you'll figure that out later. But anyway, they, they were known for their banking, manufacturing, they did all kinds of stuff, and in particular, one of the big things they manufactured was, was textiles, was cloth. In particular, they did black cloth. And so they, they had all this manufacturing, and they not only had, had medicine, they had a medical school. And that it had medical school in Laodicea, and it wasn't just any medical school. It was like a school of optometry. They focused <laughs> focused on the eyes. That's kind of a, uh, didn't mean, no pun intended. Uh, but but they focused, and, and the thing in particular they did, they had created this salve. They had created this salve that when you put on your eyes, it would help your vision. It was kind of like their version of cataract surgery. It would help bring things into focus, and they were really proud of that. And they would like really help people out with that. And so they were known for that. And because of their wealth, they had constructed these major buildings. They had these magnificent, for their day and time, for their place, these incredible buildings, an incredible skyline that could be recognized. But they were so wealthy. Get this, they were so wealthy. We've talked a lot through this series about the different places in Asia Minor that were destroyed by earthquakes. Well, Laodicea is no different. AD 60, they were destroyed by an earthquake, but they were so wealthy, they refused any help from Rome. They were like, no, we got this. Keep your money. We got this. That's, they were, and, and they found great joy and great pride in their wealth. Now, the church that's there, the church that was there was started by Paul in one of his missionary journeys. And the people there, because of, the, because of their affluence, because of what they thought this thing, the banking and the men, they, they were victims of their environment. And, and being a victim is no fun. But you know there are some people who choose to be victims, right? There are people today that maybe had something bad happen and they want to play the victim card the rest of their life. All right? And, and, and that's kind of what's going on in Laodicea. They were victims of their environment. And, and because of this, Jesus brings, in this short letter, brings four charges against them. And it's like they get arrested. Okay, here you get four counts of this, all right? But it's going to be interesting to stay with us because at the end he offers them a plea bargain. But it was up to them and it's up to us not to fall into some of the same traps. Charge number one. Charge number one is in verse 15. Look what it says. Look what it says in verse 15. It's being lukewarm. That's the charge. I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. All right? 
a lot of you probably heard that before, but let's make sure we clear something up. This is the New, new Living Translation, and it's, it's, it's accurate, but it's not completely accurate on this word, spit. Because if you go to the original Greek language, the verb, or the word, not the verb, the word there is vomit. Not just, no, like, you know, you know, the emoji, you know. And, and all right, you know, the green stuff, right? You, you got me, okay? And, and Jesus is saying, because this is what you're doing, this is how you're living. I want to vomit you out of my, have you ever eaten something and like, you, let's, we won't stay here too long, but, <laughs> but you know the feeling I'm talking about? That, and there is something in there that you know needs to get out. You know it does. And when it finally does, there's an immediate relief. You know what I'm talking about? It's just like, that's better. Just had to get that out of me. And that's what Jesus is saying to these people. He said, because of your lukewarmness, because of that, I, you make me want to puke. Wow. That's pretty strong words. And Jesus starts with this reminder, though. He starts... I know all the things you do. Remember, we, that was in the, the letter to Philadelphia, too. And we talked about how that, that's paralyzing, right? <laughs> so I, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. You know, we used to pray, oh, God, whatever's done in darkness, let it come to light. I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. And that's what Jesus said. I know everything you do. Good? Philadelphia, good? Laodicea, I know the bad stuff. I know the bad stuff that you're doing. And he then he accuses them of being lukewarm. Now here's, Jesus is such an awesome teacher. He's the master teacher because Jesus knew how to take a situation and he knew how to take the the things of that situation and use it for teaching. So here's the deal, Laodicea, that, that, that city there, they had no hot water. They had no water source, period. All the water they had had to be piped in from somewhere. And this is really cool. Look at this map. Look at this map because this Hierapolis up here, all right? Hierapolis had all these hot springs, kind of like in Arkansas or whatever. They had all these hot springs. Well, they were, there weren't pipes and pumping stations. They had to dig aqueducts, you know, which is basically a trench, all right? So let's say you've got boiling hot water up here, and it's five miles down here. What's that water going to feel like by the time it gets down here? That boiling hot water is now lukewarm, all right? Laodicea had these cool, I mean, excuse me, Colossae had these cool springs. It's about five miles over here, that aqueduct. And so this could be freezing cold water, but at the time it runs down a ditch five miles, guess what it is? Lukewarm. So when Jesus said, you are lukewarm, these people knew exactly what they lived with lukewarm. They, they lived in a lukewarm world. They understood completely. See, the amazing thing that they, they, they didn't realize or they didn't think about what was in Colossae, the cool springs were supposed to be refreshing. It was kind of like athletes today that take ice baths to, after a long, hard game or a long, hard workout. They take ice baths to kind of, re, or, or, or the hot, you know, sometimes you just need a hot shower to, re, and they weren't doing either one of them. They weren't providing either one. How many of you like coffee? Let me see your hand. Coffee drinkers in the house. Man, we need to start selling that stuff. <laughs> All right? <laughs> yeah. We might do that. Mondays through Fri- Monday through Fridays from 6 to 9. Come to Common Grounds. I'm just... Keep that in the back of your mind. Um, how many of you like hot coffee? Like hot coffee. All right? My mom... My mom's 90 now. But, so I can't get her out very much. But when I used to take her to Cracker Barrel... It, as soon as the coffee got slightly below boiling so much to burn your lips, she was getting the server to come back and fill her up because it, it's got to be that hot, all right? How many of you like iced coffee? All right, all right. I don't get that one either, but okay. That's why God made Diet Mountain Dew. But anyway, all right. How many of you like lukewarm coffee? Lord Jesus, please be with them. And <laughs> some people just surrendered their hidden secrets to you, and we pray for them. For the most part, 
normal people <laughs> either like it hot or cold. Lukewarm doesn't get the job done. And, and, and for the church at Laodicea, their lukewarmness was seen in them not being willing to take a stand for anything, just hanging out in the middle of the road like an armadillo. It led them to idleness, and they had become hardened and self-satisfied, and it was destroying themselves. In fact, do you know that your body can only last so long without food? Like, if you look at yourself in the mirror this morning, okay, I'm, this is it. Today's the day. I'm, not, I'm never eating again. Right? You're going to die. Uh, and your body's going to start eating itself because it has to have that going on. Followers of God have been called to make choices from the very beginning of time. Once again, let's go back. We do, we do this quite often. We need to be reminded. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis, in the first two chapters of Genesis. It's awesome. It's this utopia. Adam and Eve are hanging out there. They're just loving life. And God, it says, was walking with them in the cool of the evening every night in the Garden of Eden for Genesis 1 and 2. And in Genesis 3, this snake shows up. And says, why don't you eat that tree? At first, nobody, they, it was like that she didn't even think about him being a talking snake or anything like that. It's like, well, we can't eat of that tree. We, we can't eat of that tree because God said don't. And he said, yeah, God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because you'll know as much as he knows. You'll be just like God. You need to eat of that tree. So she does. It was a choice. It was a choice. Adam followed along and we're all still dealing with the consequences of that choice. All right. Life's all about choices. A few chapters later in the Bible, there's a guy named Moses. Moses has been God's chosen leader. He led the people out of bondage. He gets them to the edge of the promised land. They don't go on. And Moses makes a bad choice and is told that he can't go into the promised land. So at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, he's getting ready to pass the baton to Joshua and for Joshua to take the people on into the promised land. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting verse 15, look what it says here. This is a New Living Translation. It says, now listen today. I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God uh, and to keep his commands. That's how you show your love for God. You keep his commands and decrees and regulations by walking in his ways. Not your ways, not the world's ways, not what feels good to you, but walking his ways. That's how you show your love for God. If you do this, if you do this, you will live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you and the land you're about to enter and occupy. Keep going. But if your, heart, if your heart turns away, how can a heart turn away? And refuse to listen. Don't do what he says. Don't do what his word says. Make up your own rules. And if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, little G, not big G, little G God, then I warn you, God, don't play. Then I warn you now that you will certainly be what? Destroyed. You will not live a long and a good life in the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses, and I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Do you realize that to a certain degree, the choices you make affect not only you, but they affect your descendants, and that you could take them a long way? You change some things for your family today, all right? The, the choices we make are critical, and, and you start down a path that's a bad path, and your kids may not ever recover from it. Understand that. Understand that. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God and obeying Him and committing yourself firmly to Him. Life is all about choices. Now, I want to ask you something. God is here, and He's doing something. But if He were suddenly standing here in a physical form that we could see and that we could experience, and it got to the end of the, and He stood here and He said, all right, you got a choice today. Life, death. Lukewarm doesn't work. What are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? When you came in today, hopefully you were given a card that looks like this. If you did, grab it right now, just for a second. Nobody else is ever going to see this unless you give it to them. I don't want it back. All right, I got my own stuff to deal with. All right, I don't need to deal with yours right now. All right, 
But on this is just a little thermometer and there's a scripture that we're talking about today as a reminder. I want you to spend some time this week filling out your thermometer and figuring out where you're hot, where you're cold, and where you're lukewarm. And on those lukewarm ones, maybe you want to turn it over and on the back of it, right? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do to make some changes to get out of that lukewarm state so that you don't end up a pile of vomit? The second charge. The first charge was they were lukewarm. The second was that they were consumed by their wealth. Remember, they, they loved their wealth. They loved their banking, they, but they were consumed by it. Look what Jesus says to them in verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need nothing. And, and that's the Kentucky translation. And, <laughs> and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, and then you will be rich. See, they were known for their banking industry, and it gave them this false sense of security. And, and while on one hand, there's nothing, don't, don't, don't misunderstand, there ain't nothing wrong with money. In, in fact, here in this same book, God tells you, go out and make it and use it wisely. There ain't nothing wrong with money. But acquiring possessions and wealth has an intoxicating effect on it. You know what I'm talking about? You know, there's a lot of things out there that in and of themselves are not bad, but we get to liking it too much and start using it more and more and it becomes intoxicating and suddenly we're out of control. And life is out of control. If money, I was thinking about this week, this is 2,000 years ago, this church. 2,000 years ago. If 2,000 years ago, this church on the edge of the desert was struggling, was struggling and distracted because of finances, how much easier is it for us to be distracted today? To be messed up in what we're chasing, not seeing the outcome. I read something this week that was disturbing. I was shocked. I read a statistic this week in a magazine that the 2022 numbers aren't out yet because it's still too early. But in 2021, this magazine showed that from people that self-identified themselves as believers, you're, doing, you're walking down the street, somebody says, hey, are you a believer in Christ? You say yes, and they start asking questions. One of the questions they asked was how much you give to the church. Do you know that in 2021, people who self-identified themselves as Christians, as believers, gave a smaller percentage of their income to the church than people did in the Great Depression. What's up with that? What's up with that? On so many levels, what's up with that? I put before you today a choice between greed and generosity. Choose generosity. That's why when we do our pathways, and Jason teaches the second half of First Step, and he teaches about those banners, and he gets to that give banner, and he teaches about that, that we don't focus on them as much on what you give as just a generous spirit. Because if we have a generous spirit, what we give will take care of itself. If we know that everything we have came from God in the first place, and without Him we won't have nothing, uh, then, then it's a lot easier to be generous, because it's not yours in the first place. Charge number one. Lukewarm. Make me want to vomit. Charge number two, you're consumed by your wealth. Charge number three, you're caught up in appearances. All right? Look at the second part of verse 18. And also I encourage you to buy white garments from me so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness. Laodicea is known for their textile industry, and in particular, the black garments they had. And is known as a symbol of pride and of shame, uh, pride and, and uh, of ego. It's kind of like brand name stuff today. Yeah, check out. I got, you know, my, my polo, my Gucci, my whatever, my Nikes, my kicks, whatever. You know, and, and we want everybody to know that. We want to make sure we put the name brand. You can even go online and you can buy fake name brands to stick on your stuff. You know, you can buy the, the Nike Swish and the, the, the polo guy on the horse and the eyes on alligator and stick them on your regular shirt. Like you can do all that. But we're stuck up in the pride thing. 
We're stuck up in the pride thing of what we wear and, and our appearance. And, and the amazing thing is, you know, fashion trends, fashion trends are so interesting because they seem to be so cyclical. Like I, I grew up, I was, a, I was a teenager in the 70s. And so like I can remember first time I went to middle school dance and then high school dances and proms and Saturday Night Fever and we were all rocking our bell bottoms. And then the 80s came along and they went away and people swore those things will never, ever, 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 ever be back. They're back. <laughs> like, come on. Come on, are you kidding me? Here's the other thing about fashion. You know every generation has its own sense of cool. And it almost always looks silly to the very next generation. People they ought to see thought they were clothed in coolness. But Jesus saw past their outward appearance and knew that they were clothed in darkness, which unfortunately meant they were surrounded by darkness. See, all the apparel does is covered up their nakedness. White, black, it doesn't matter. It just was covering up their blemishes, their wrinkles, their, their age spots, their whatever. That's all that the clothes did. But Jesus isn't even talking about clothes, not physical clothes. He's talking about how many of us try to cover up our spiritual nakedness. Because we don't want anybody to see. We don't want anybody to want to see the stuff that we're so messed up with. We don't want anybody to know that we go to a recovery group. We don't want anybody to know that we're crazy, stupid, in debt. We don't want anybody to know all these things and we're spiritually struggling because we're trying to cover it up and we're trying to clothe it instead of just saying, I need to get clean. Because here's the deal, Jesus wasn't interested in what they were actually wearing. He was interested in getting down to their spiritual nakedness and cleaning them up. That's what he wanted to do, and that's why some of you are here today. Because some of you came in today hiding some stuff that Jesus wants to clean up so that you can have a better life, so that your kids can have a better life, so that your grandkids, so that your great, great, great grandkids that you won't ever meet until you get to heaven will have a better life because of decisions you make today. Hmm. You're lukewarm. You're consumed by wealth. You're consumed by appearance and and society. Charge number four, and you're spiritually blind. He goes down to their, their, their eye salve. He said, that ointment you make for your eyes? You, know, you put that on so you'll be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. See, Laodicea was known for that medical salve for their eyes, but Jesus takes that and uses it as a teaching tool, as a marker, and turns it into their spiritual sight, which is far more important because this church had grown lukewarm and lost its burning vision for the lost. That's what compromise and tolerance will do. Compromise and tolerance will lead to blindness. Remember those blind spots we talked about a couple weeks ago? When you're turning, you're moving your vehicle, and I talked about my truck and looking for looking past the blind spots. Remember we talked about that? Sometimes there's blind spots that we point out in other people before we point them out in ourselves. You know, like if you're watching a ball game and all of a sudden there's a call that you don't like and you're yelling at the referee, can't you see that? Can't you see that? Or you're a parent and you're yelling at your kid, tell them, don't you see what you're doing? No, they don't. You're the adult, be the adult. Tell them what they're doing. But we can easily, we, we much, it's much more easier for us to see other people's blind spots than our own. Because we're blind. That's how it works. And Jesus says, I want to help you to see. I want to help you to see. I think right here, Jesus is inviting the Laodiceans and the Shelby Villians to renew their focus, to make sure that they understand that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, to stay focused on the main thing no matter what, no matter what. Because sometimes decisions are life and death, and life is full of choices. Stanislav Petrov may not be a household name, but without him, you wouldn't have a household. Because in 1983, 
This young man was a lieutenant for the Soviet Union Air Defense Forces. He was working the night shift and he looked on his screen and suddenly saw what appeared to be five U.S. nuclear missiles headed toward Russia. In a split second, he made the decision that something was wrong. He didn't push the panic button. He didn't start all out nuclear war. He thought, why in the world, if they were going to do this, would they only send five? If this was really what it looks like it is, the screen would be covered with them. So he didn't panic. He began to check out his computer, and he found out that the radar screen was messed up, was faulty. That split second could have changed the world. Historians say that and the Cuban Missile Crisis were the closest instances to full-out nuclear war that our world has ever seen. And this one was averted with a blink decision. Something's not right here. Life is all about choices. I told you that there were four charges. We looked at the four charges, but I also told you there was a plea bargain. Let's finish this thing up really quick. Let's go to the very end. Oh, hey, guys. Uh, (laughs) Different button, different time. All right, let's go to the very last verse in verse 20. In verse 20, after these four charges, Jesus gives them a plea bargain agreement. A plea bargain agreement. Okay, it's on. There we go. There, here it is, all right? Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. I didn't read one of the words that was up there because it's not actually in the text. I just added it. So I want to make sure that you knew that it wasn't what Jesus said, but it was what he said. Grace. That's so cool there, because here's this church that hadn't got nothing right. They screwed up everything. They ain't got nothing right. And it'd be so easy to say, man, I'm a, remember last week you said, Jesus said, I'm the one that opens doors no one else can open and I close doors no one else can uh, shut and I do all that stuff. It'd been so easy for Jesus to slam the door instead. He, hey, you need one more chance? You need one more chance? Jesus stood at the door of the church of Laodicea and knocked. He said, I'm standing out here. You guys have screwed everything up. If you open the door, I'll come in. Guys, I want you to listen to me. I don't even understand it all, but God's up to something. And I understand this. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that some of you are here today, today, because you needed one more knock. You needed one more opportunity to get it right because you're not guaranteed another one and he's standing at the door and knocking he's standing at the door and knocking life's full of choices it's up to us to make the right ones would you guys stand with me I don't know who I don't know what but I know we gotta make choices so here real quick let me lay out the choices and we're gonna sing Some of you have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you know that there's things in your life that have gotten lukewarm, and you need to repent of those things. That's what renewal and revival is all about. You need to repent of those things. And so you may be able to do it while you stand and sing. You may need to kneel at your seat. You may need to come up to the front like some people did in first service and just just pray. Just pray, God, I don't want to be lukewarm anymore. I want to get things right. But some of you may need to take that next step. Some of you may need to take that next step and do exactly what Josh did. And sir, I remember the first time I talked to that dude. I knew him for months before he knew that I knew him because Brad had already asked me to start praying for him. And I remember the first time I talked to Josh. You remember that? We were out in the lobby one night and I said, dude, when are you going to get baptized? And, and Josh said, well, I got to get some stuff. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't have to get some stuff. To get, cause, and, and, and so I don't know. I don't know what your stuff is, but I know you don't have to get it right. In fact, you can't get it right. Jesus is the only one who can get it right. And the only way you get it is to get Jesus into your life. 
And so look, I don't care. I can stay here. We can do far more, but we got clothes in the back. We can change your clothes. I don't care. I'll go in like this, all right? But if you need to make Jesus Lord of your life today, today is the day. He is knocking. He is knocking. Come on, my soul. Come on. Come on. Let's make some choices, and let's get it right today. Let's go. Let's sing the chorus. something. If this is your first time here, man, I'm glad you came. I'm glad you came today. Stop out at the I'm New Wall out in the lobby. It's big orange wall. You can't miss it. We got a gift for you out there. We'd love to get to know you a little bit. And then I also like to invite you to come back. Tuesday night is our Pathways for the month of February. If you haven't been able to get online and sign up, it's where you can become a member of the church, where you can take the next step into life groups or next step into ministry and serving. Then if you haven't already been able to do it online, stop back in that corner right back there. There's a little counter. Bobby's back there. He'll get you signed up back there. And then next week, next week, Jason is going to kick off Thursday night and next Sunday a brand new series that's going to take us into Easter. It's about some really cool things that happen on different hills in the Bible. And so our next sermon series is called Straight Off the Hill. And then, yes, there will be t-shirts. All right. So, all right. All right. So we want to see you guys here next week. Until then, let's get out of here. Go love God, love people, watch him keep changing the world. Hey guys, I'm Evan. And this is